thank you for joining us. As you come into the session today, please make sure that your microphones are muted. You ready? Can I go? Yep, people are coming in, but I, you can get started if you'd like. So, it's a little bit about what we're going to be talking about today. Um, yeah, let's get started by making the presentation go. There we go. Uh, there's a couple of slides at the front that I thought maybe I would show when I was just waiting for people to get ready. But we're going to start right on time. So this is an un a user's guide to the new underground storage tank regulations, in case you don't know what UST stands for. And you'll find those in 40 CFR 280, that's the federal regulations. A little bit about myself, I'm Robert Largent. Um, I have worked with the Cherokee Nation for 12 years, so I'm a Cherokee citizen. I worked with the tribes doing underground storage tank work and several other different environmental medias. I have all sorts of credentials and licenses. Um, the hardest one I ever took was NACE. NACE was extremely hard. If you, uh, NACE stands for National Association of Corrosion Engineers. So if you have that one, good on you, because it's tough. I uh, have GIS certifications, I have UST installers. I also do a lot of things online. I have YouTube videos specifically about gas stations, underground storage tanks, and those type of things. I have a LinkedIn group that is focused on underground storage tanks compliance. And I've been a Petroleum Equipment Institute forum moderator since about 2004 also. I worked with the EPA, tribes, states on modifying EPA UST regulations in several different occasions. So for the 2005 Energy Policy Act, we worked on those, and then more recently, the new EPA regulations. And I have a wide, broad spectrum of um, environmental experience. I climbed smokestacks for my first job out of college. I've done air sampling, worked at water treatment. I've been baptized by the sediment and soil soilage at the wastewater treatment plants. Uh, so I've done a lot of different things and I've taught college. So when you talk about UST, UST compliance has basically one slogan. Whenever someone asks you a question about UST compliance, your first answer is almost always gonna be, it depends. Because you never know what that system is like until you go do your background checks, figure out when it was installed, figure out what kind of equipment is there, figure out um, who installed it, what state it's in. So you've got all sorts of the things that you have to answer before you can even begin answering a question like, what do I do about my, whatever they're talking about. Some intro terminology to underground storage tank words, USTs, that's underground storage tanks. Those are tanks that are buried underground. ATG, you'll often hear people just say Vitaroot because Vitaroot's the big ATG manufacturer on the market, but there's also Franklin Fueling, Red Jacket, which is owned by Vitaroot. So if I mess up and I'm talking about an ATG and I say Vitaroot, I mean the same thing. I just I get caught up in it sometimes too. All of our stores have beta roots. All of our facilities have beta roots. So that's just what I get used to saying. Interstitial space is the space between two walls. And for our situations, that's the space between the inner tank and the outer tank or inner piping or outer piping or inner wall of a sump or an outer wall or sump. So interstitial space, you'll also often hear it called annular space. Because these terms in uh, the UST world can be so, there can be so many synonyms for the same thing. Uh, EPA and several uh, community organizations have gotten together trying to make a standard for all this is fueling equipment data. So if you wanna get involved, you can click on that link right there. And you'll find throughout this presentation, a lot of the pictures have links in them. I'll call those Easter eggs. And then a lot of the words themselves have links to uh, different places on the internet with more information. So um, one of the guys I was, I do things with a lot, said this is like um, inception. There's a thing inside a thing inside a thing. So a lot of my presentations and my, a lot of the information I give out is like inception. So one of the things that we talk about a lot that you may not use the exact right name for is these right here. Normally the customer would call these your pumps. But in the industry, we all know these are dispensers because these are your pumps. For a pressurized system, which is what most of the systems in the US are, the pump is actually in the tank and it pulls product up and pushes it to the dispenser. 
except, now there's always an exception, it depends. If you have a suction system, then the pump is actually in the system. Right there is the pump for this suction system. So these are the pumps. So the agenda for what we're going to talk about. Uh, first, I'm going to start off with what is the exchange? Um, one of the things that I find a lot of times is when I go places, I use APHIS or Army and Air Force Exchange Service to describe who I work for. And you'll see that in my bio. And people don't know what that is. So we're going to go through a little bit about what that is and how big a universe we have. Then we're talking about retail gas stations and just running them. Then we're going to get down to the 40 CFR 280. And I'm going to throw a little bit more stuff in there just for extra content because it's interesting. The exchange, you can see our big exchange symbol right there. That's two chevrons. It is 125 years. We've been the Department of Defense's largest retailer. Um, we are for the Army and Air Force. There are separate exchanges for the Navy, the Marines, and the Coast Guard, but they're much smaller than we are. We provide tax-free shopping and services to more than 12 million. Since 1895, we've had many names. Army and Air Force Exchange Service, if you know somebody that is a military member, they would call us AFES. If you know somebody that worked for the organization, we call ourselves AFES. And a lot of times, older movies, older things, you'll hear about the BX, the PX, those are us, just in our past life. Those are the base exchange and the post exchange. About 2004, we rebranded as just the exchange. Even though, whenever you talk to most people out there, they still call us AFES. Uh, we're the 62nd largest retailer in the United States. We're the number 36 convenience store. The number is really misleading. We're much bigger than that. Um, the publication I got that information out of only listed us as having about 100 gas stations. We have about three times that many. So when it, it's hard for these publications to know a lot about us because we're kind of secretive. You don't know much about us unless you're in the military or associated military. So we're like undercover. Uh, we have more than 4,000 facilities in 33 countries. And with all these facilities and all these movie stores and the warehouse and the bakeries and the airline catering we do and the 35,000 associates, we have one environmental person. I am the environmental person for the Army and Air Force Exchange Service. I am over all environmental things that are associated with the Army and Air Force Exchange Service. So if you ever have an environmental thing that has anything to do with us, I would be your point of contact. Uh, our gas stations are usually branded as expresses and they are prominent throughout most of these locations. You can see here's a map of where locations are across the US and the world. This doesn't really detail. We have a lot of smaller exchanges that you won't see on here. I know up by where I'm from in Tahlequah, there's one at Camp Gruber. So I know there are a lot more out there that aren't listed on here, but you can only list so many. Here are numbers for 2019. Um, we did 8.6 billion in revenue. Um, we have seven plants providing baked goods and water overseas. We do school lunches overseas to the Dodd schools. Uh, the big thing for me is, of course, the 438 million gallons of fuel dispensed. And that's just our retail fuel. That doesn't count our fleet facilities. Uh, we have our own trucking fleet that goes across the US, Germany, um, Korea, Japan, Italy. So we're all over the world with our own fleet. And we have 11 distribution centers. These distribution centers, we have to be in charge of everything at those. They're not on military installations, so those are completely run by us. Our motto is we go where the military goes or we go where you go. We have had associates die in the line of duty, so it is not without risk to work for us. Whenever the military ends up in Afghanistan or Iraq, we're there. We provide goods and services to those military members. We're not out on the front line holding a rifle, but their camps, we are there providing them with their staples that they would hope to have from home so that they get a taste of home and they don't feel so far away. We've been trying to expand our customer base. We recently opened up our online portal to shop my exchange. So if you are dis uh, honorably discharged veteran, you can shop at shopmyexchange.com. We've also opened up our stores again to service-connected service disabled veterans. And we're trying to get it so that our cat cards, any cat cards on installations can shop at our stores. Because right now, if you just have a cat card, you're civilian on, on installation, you can't shop at our, our stores. This is just another page discussing the Veterans Online Shopping Benefit and how it 
works. Now we're going to talk about our exchange gasoline distri distribution facilities. And I use the term GDF because it's one of the terms that the air regulations use to, to talk about gasoline stores, gasoline stations, they don't really use convenience stores. In the universe today, there are, according to NACS, which is the National Association of Convenience Stores, there are about 152,000 U.S. convenience stores. About 80% of those sell motor fuels. You know, a lot of the motor fuel sales are going more towards box stores. You can see at Sam's, Kroger's, uh, Costco. A lot of these places are starting to get into the fuel business. So you can see a lot more convenience stores that don't sell fuel. You'll see a lot of 7-Elevens around the country that are convenience stores that don't sell fuel. Um, the USC count by the EPA as of March 2020, there were 541,532 active USTs at approximately 193,000 facilities. So that's distribution centers, that's gas stations, that's all USTs. Our USD-verse for the exchange, we have about 300 gas stations uh, in eight countries. Most of them are inside gates at military installations, but you can find some of our stores. The installations have shrunk, they've been bracked, and so some of our stores are actually outside the gates. Not a whole lot. They're supposed to not, they're supposed to ID people and not let people that don't have a cat card buy gas there, but it's kind of hard to regulate. Um, over 1,200 tanks that we're responsible for. We are responsible for our transportation. We have Midway points, way stations, what are they called? Anyway, places where they can go just get gas. They don't do anything else. They leave a trailer there. They leave gas. We have one in Wichita, Kansas. We have distribution centers, California, Virginia, Texas, uh, overseas. We have facilities, maintenance uh, groups. They have their own tanks with some fuels in those, sometimes diesel. And we have emergency generators with USTs at some of our locations. Our headquarter has an emergency generator with two 10,000 gallon diesel tanks hooked up to it and waste oil because we do run some uh, car repair service centers. We have Firestone, some other contractors doing it, but we have our own at some locations. Some of the things that you, you don't think about when you're operating a gas station, we open gas stations to make money. I mean, that's, that's the main reason they open a gas station, but gas is very low profit. You make your money by getting people to go into the store and buy the high dollar things like chips and drinks and tacos and other things. We're doing a lot of pizza at a lot of our stores now. So you get the people to go in there and that's where the money go comes from. And right now, our goal is the Army and Air Force Exchange is to make money so that we can give that money back to the military welfare and recreation programs for our military service people. Another thing you'll see at a lot of gas stations is accidents. Gas stations are just magnets for accidents. There's, I get accident reports all the time. Wide range of things happen at gas stations from people running over the dispensers, from driving off with the hose still installed. Um, the bottom left one, one of, is one of our stores in Lackland, uh, San Antonio. Customer was trying to fill up a gas container in the back of his truck, static caught it on fire, caught him on fire. And luckily he wasn't hurt too bad, but we have signs everywhere telling people not to put containers in the back of their vehicles and fill them, but you'll still see people do that. And static is a big issue at these locations. Thefts. Luckily, we don't have a lot of thefts. And if I had a piece of wood to knock on, I would. But they do occur. We have a couple sites that are outside the gates that have been robbed on uh, and has happened. So. We try to make sure our management, our staff are in a good shape. But being inside the bases, we don't have to, to worry about that as much as other places. Top right is a trailer that they've actually pulled up on top of the, the tank pit, and they are stealing gas out of the tanks. And that has happened numerous times across the country. Has not happened at one of our locations yet, but we try to keep all of our fill pipes locked just for that. It won't really stop them. If they're really determined, they're going to get past those locks. We try to make sure that we keep them locked for several reasons. In the bottom right, skimming has become a big problem at a lot of these gas stations. The thieves are becoming very good at putting skimmers in. When nobody's paying attention, they will then just Bluetooth the information from there. They don't ever have to get back into it again. We have not run into that yet, but I know a lot of sites and a lot of places do deal with it. 
So my advice is when you go up to the gas station and if you have to use your card, try and pick a dispenser that's closest to the front of the store or the best lit area so that it's, or that it's cameras pointed at it. Cause you want to know, you want to be, try to be sure that you're not going to get skimmed. And then we also have people that, you know, we, we have to make sure they're 21. Yeah, there's a lot of soldiers that aren't 21 yet. They still have to be 21 to buy liquor and some tobacco products. These are all some of the regulations that the gas store manager has to worry about. And the main one we're going to talk about, and the most important one to me, 40 CFR 280, the UST regulations. You know, and there's lots of things in that. Then NFPA, National Fire Prevention Association, they have a couple regulations about gas stations. Petroleum Equipment Institute has four or five RPs that focus on gas stations. American Petroleum Institute, they have several um, publications about what color the fill pipe lids have to be for different products. They have insulation guidelines, so they have a few things. 40 CFR part 63 subpart CC, CC, CC is the NESHAP GDF air regulations. Um, these are basically stage one vapor recovery. They wanna make sure you're recovering, the delivery driver is recovering vapors whenever they drop fuel into the tanks. Weights and measures, they'll come out there to make sure a gallon of gas is a gallon of gas when you're pumping it out to the customer, that you're given the proper octane levels. And that when you say you're selling them premium, that you're actually selling them 91 octane premium. I've had sites call me, IRS is here. They want a sample of our diesel. That was one I didn't ever expect, but apparently they want to make sure this site was not selling red dye diesel. So they took a sample of their diesel and took it to be analyzed to make sure they were not selling farm diesel because there's some write-offs to that. Summer versus winter, there should be two apprentices there. Um, read vapor pressure. This is one of those things that affects the small areas of the country. The refineries have to go from a winter blend to a summer blend. This is something that we've been written up for in El Paso before because when they came out to sample, we didn't have the right type fuel, but we have no control over that. It comes from the refinery the way it comes from the refinery. Um, so it's not really fair that we get rid of it, but still, you'll find that with a lot of these regulations, the gas station gets written up regardless whose fault it is. And then they have to worry about these you know, food licenses, liquor licenses, SIGs. So there's a lot of things that a store manager has to worry about. And the dispensary you see there, though, yes, those are bullet holes in that dispenser. So there are, some crazy things that happen at gas stations. Now we're gonna go into the new EPA UST regulations. So this is what you actually came here to listen to instead of me just meander on about all this other stuff. Let's get into it. So why don't we regulate USTs? Uh, anybody that's been in the in UST field for a while knows 83, 60 minutes came out with a story called Check the Water. In Rhode Island, there were several underground storage tanks that were leaking and getting into people's drinking water at their houses. When that came out, it gave the impetus to the Congress to start passing some of these regulatory guidelines to make sure these things don't happen anymore. And US2 releases are the most common source of groundwater contamination and petroleum is the most common contaminant. The history of the regulations, they were originally adopted in 1988, but most of the language in them gave everything until 1998 to actually be implemented. So you had a lot of leeway for a lot of the stuff they came out with. Then they came out with the Energy Policy Act of 2005. It had some small requirements that changed some of the guidelines. The operator training was included in that. Um, the ability for states to implement the UST regulations on federal facilities was part of that. And then 2011, the most recent version of the EPA UST regulations, um, with an effective date of October 13th, 2015. That's the one we're gonna be focused on. So the UST regulations, they changed certain portions of 88 regulations and the key changes established federal requirements that are like key portions of the NG Plus Act 2005. But in addition, we added new operation and maintenance requirements and addressed some of the UST systems that were deferred in the 88 regulations. You'll find, I put a lot of text in some of these slides. I don't plan on reading all the text. I put it there for your information so that when you take these home, you'll have, or when you 
Don't print them because that's a waste of paper and I'm an environmental guy, so do not print them. But when you read these on your computer, you can see all this information. You can follow all these hyperlinks. Hopefully you've downloaded the PDF. I put that in the files. I don't know if I told you I did that or just did it. Anyway, so the 2015 new UST regulations, they rolled out three, there's three basic dates for the states to implement these. Uh, 13 October, 2015, 11 October, 2016, and I'll go into these in more depth. When these regulations were coming out, EPA put out their guidelines saying it costs about 715 a year an average facility. Well, the PMAA came out and argued with them, said it costs about $2,500 a year. My experience is somewhere in between. Um, and it depends on your site. If your site was built properly, it doesn't cost nearly as much as a site that has to do a lot of upgrades or hasn't been maintained very well. This is just an overview of the UST requirements or the requirements. Each of these has hyperlinks taking you to different places that you can read more about these topics. So the state response to these new regulations, oops, damn. Uh, I just spilled my drink. We've had a spill. Anyway. Ah, it's cold. Because there were- As long as you're okay, we're okay, Robert. We're all here. Yeah. And everybody's saying we've got you. So keep it going. Everything's going great. At least I don't have to report it. It's not over 25 gallons. So <laughs> I'm not saying it is or not petroleum based or alcohol based, but it's my Bucky's cup. UST nerds love Bucky's. Okay. I'll try to get back on course here. My foot's cold. So as of July, 2020, 47 states have updated their UST regulations. There's more that are out for comment. I know New Mexico is out for comment right now. Hawaii is out for comment. Um, I think Virginia might be out for comment right now. If you go to the, P, the LinkedIn site, I usually put those up when they're out for comment so that everybody knows and can jump in and say if they're good or bad. Some of the state regulations are already in effect and enforceable. Uh, some of them have been surpassing the new regulations. California's had a lot of this stuff in, in line already. They've been trying to carry them on. Some states, um, they're not enforcing them until after October 13th, 2021, um, which is kind of our, they're in effect, but they're not being enforced. Um, so you don't, for those states, you don't have to do much yet. So what's regulated? UST is larger than 110 gallons. One of the things that they have listed as, as being regulated is a UST system with any piping that contains at least 10% of its combined volume underground. I've never seen a site that had more than 10% of its volume in the piping, but I guess they could exist. That's one of the things about USTs. I don't know everything yet. I'm still learning guys, so if you've got something that you want to share with me, I'd be more than happy to learn about it. I'm trying to get my clock to go on here so I know how much time I have because I'm a talker. Um, this also applies to UST systems storing either petroleum or certain hazardous substances or systems that are not exempt or excluded. Some of the exempt systems, if they're storing heating oil for consumptive use, uh, residential farm tanks that are 1,100 gallons or less, Stormwater or wastewater collection system. I'm not going to really go over those very much because if they're exempt, I don't need to talk about them that much. Some of the things that they address were deferrals. And on the right, you'll see a must for us. If you go to the EPA website, this is a great document for you to have. It tells you a lot about the new regulations, a lot about the things that you need to be looking at. If you haven't opened it and looked at it before, it's, it's a great resource. One of the things I can't talk about much because I don't have any experience with them is airport hydrant systems and field constructed tanks. Uh, I can read you the regulations here, but I can't give you a lot of input on it because I've never had to deal with them. I would like to know more about them just because I'm curious, but it's not something I can really help you with. Other deferrals, uh, wastewater treatment tank systems, UCs containing radio radioactive materials. And again, these are things that 
I don't have a lot of experience with, so I can't really give you a lot of insight. So let's jump into the new regulations starting October 13th, 2015. You had to test and inspect systems following any repair. Pretty much that's a good thing. And you wanna make sure the repairs are good. If they're not good, then it's not gonna do you much good. Newly installed emergency generator UCs have to have release detection. You have to demonstrate your system is compatible with fuels greater than E10 or B20. Here you have more information about emergency generator USTs. Uh, basically you have to have leak detection on these tanks. Uh, there was a great emergency generator UST webinar by the New England Institute of Water Pollution Control Commission. If you're not familiar with them, uh, there's a link to some of their, the content they put out. They organized the National Tanks Conference. If you work with USTs quite a bit, I recommend going to the National Tanks Conference. Um, the California Coupa Conference is another good resource for information on underground storage tanks, especially related to California regulations. Uh, it's one of those conferences that I go to and I still learn things. There's other conferences that you go to that they're aimed at beginners. So if you're a beginner, they're great for you, but once you're in the field, it's a little bit more difficult to actually learn things out of them. New Epic puts out the less line. It's usually got information on UST related information, including cleanups, um, different methods of cleaning up tanks out there, uh, things that are going on in the field. They put out a lot of webinars and they do a lot of trainings. Biofuel compatibility, the link right there will take you to a lot of the equipment manufacturers have come up with their own statements saying whether or not they're compatible with different types of biofuels. Um, most equipment has biofuel compatibility. The one thing that has been lacking biofuel compatibility is usually pipe dope. Pipe dope is one of those issues that is still, they're getting more and more, it's been one of those that has been overlooked by the industry that we need to make sure that they are putting out compatibility statements so that if you use them on systems that, like an E85 system, that this equipment will work with that. And you have to maintain these records for as long as the biofuel blend is stored. You have to make sure your system is protected from corrosion. How we do that nowadays, make sure the materials that you're making the system out of don't corrode. Uh, on the left side, you have a plastic sump, uh, fiberglass tank at the bottom and in the top middle. The top right is a steel tank that has a clad, cladding around it so that it'll keep it from uh, rusting. Then you have fiberglass pipe and you have flex pipe. And those are the main materials to keep your systems from corroding. Um, starting April 2016, all your systems have to have secondary containment and interstitial monitoring. Uh, you have to have under, dispen under dispenser containment sumps whenever you change these dispensers. And light line leak detectors are required on new pressurized lines. You can't just use a sump sensor. The 2015 regulations, like I talked about, secondary containment. You have to have double wall tanks, double wall pipes. This is what it looks like to monitor these systems. On the top right, you can I can tell that that's a fiberglass tank. What that is is a fiberglass tank with a dry interstice. So you have a probe that goes all the way to the bottom. And if any liquid touches that, you can see this probe that's pointed at it. That's a sensor right there that goes down all the way to the bottom. And if any liquid touches it, it goes into alarm. The next one is for steel tanks. It can also be used for a lot of different ways because it's just a float. It's a float sensor that goes at the bottom of this mantra pipe in this steel tank right here, and it goes all the way to the bottom, and if liquid touches it in the dry interstice, it goes into alarm. And then the third one to your left, the, this one on the left, is for a hydrostatic reservoir. So if your double wall interstice is filled with water or liquid or brine, um, usually it's a brine solution, something that won't freeze easily or won't change um, volume by temperature. So it's not likely to expand when it gets hot or contract when it gets cold. Then this one will tell you, it usually has two sensors in it, a high level and a low level. So it'll go into alarm if the liquid drains out of there and it'll go into alarm if the liquid goes above it. So if you have a leak, either way could happen, depending on how your water table is outside. Then you have to have dispenser containment, and this is what it looks like underneath your dispensers. And that's so that if anything leaks under the dispenser, it goes straight into that 
And usually you'll have a sensors down there that'll cause it to go an alarm. And these are different kinds of line leak detectors. You'll have your electronic line leak detector or your mechanical line leak detector. And both of those um, have different pl pluses and minuses. The electronic line leak detector checks your system more frequently. Mechanical line leak detector depends on your customers coming to tell you whenever something is going on with your system because it just slows the flow and should, in basic theory, your customer is the alarm because they'll come in and tell you your, your system is going slow. And the first thing you need to check is, well, first thing you'll check is your filters, your nozzle, and then your line leak detectors. A UST, UST systems have to be properly installed. One of the guidances for proper installation is from PEI RP100 at the bottom left. This tells you different ways to install your system. Uh, NFPA has some guidance on installing systems. API has guidance on installing systems. And then the manufacturers, usually when you get a tank, it comes with the recommended installation procedures in the installation manual with the tank. So they tell you how much peat gravel to put in there. They tell you um, how much buoyancy they can hold, how thick your um, parking lot or cover over the tanks needs to be, all that kind of information. And if you don't have dead men or it's not installed properly, they may pop right out of the ground. Here's what we're talking about. And when we talk about spill buckets, that's the areas, the red lid is usually mean the premium fuel. You can see that spill bucket has sensors on the bottom of it so that if it gets liquid in there, it sets off alarm. You have your STP sump, your sub turbine sump that has sensor on the bottom also. So that if any liquid gets in there, it sets off alarm. And then your under dispenser container sump. So this is just the side view of those things. It's because if we're going to keep talking about them, I want you guys to know what we're talking about. And these are what they look like from above ground. You'll usually see the spill buckets out there by the, the on top of the tanks. Your STP sumps are covered with, it's a huge metal manhole cover. They're quite heavy. Um, one of the, some states insist that you open those every month. They're extremely heavy. So you, you need to make sure you have the proper people opening those. They have the proper equipment. We used to have a magnet. When I opened them a lot with Cherokee Nation, we had a magnet we carried around that would help lift those a lot easier. Fiberglass ones come off okay, but they can get stuck too. And they crack a little bit easier than the metal ones do. Both of them degrade pretty well. And here's just all the equipment involved with your UST system. You see there's a lot of things involved. Uh, monitoring wells, you don't usually have those on new systems now. Those are kind of out, outside for leak detection. You may still put them in because they're a great way to tell if you've had a release. You can drop a baler down the monitoring well, and you pull it up, you can see that there's gas in, in the back soil. Um, ball float valves, those are again, those are something you can't use on new installations. You may still have them on older systems, but they've been phased out for the most part. Uh, vacuum lines, these membrane vapor recovery systems are only on stage two vapor recovery systems, which are basically in California. I think Washington DC may still have them. Not very many places have those anymore, thankfully. Um, you have your overflow prevention valves. This is flex pipe going in from the STP to the dispensers. So you have a lot of equipment in there that you have to be aware of and you have to make sure it doesn't rust, it doesn't leak, it doesn't have any issues going on with it. So starting in October, 2018, this is when the good stuff kicked off. Your AB operators have to be trained. They have to be trained within 30 days. All your sumps and spill buckets have to be liquid tight. Um, you have to upgrade to double wall piping if you replace 50% or more of your single wall pipe run. You have to keep testing inspection records for at least three years. You have to respond to all sump alarms. Here is a little bit more information. Uh, when you test for liquid tightness on your spill buckets and your containment sumps, the usual reference is PEI RP1200. Uh, that tells you that you have to fill those up with liquid above the top of penetration fitting. There are other ways you can test these now. There's a low liquid level from PMAA. They call it the PMAA method. Basically, if you have a sump sensor in there, you just have to put liquid in there until that sump sensor goes in alarm. That sump sensor has to shut down everything when it goes into alarm. There's another method out there where they put a, uh, basically it's a fog system. They use lasers. I've only seen it a couple times. You have to, 
drill holes into the concrete, put these things in, those things give off vapors and those vapors, if they enter the sump, you know you've got a leak. And there's one other method I can't remember off the top of my head. But, so there are different methods out there. The most, you have to make sure the state accepts those methods first off and some will only accept PEI RP 1200 method. Some will accept the low level. Some are starting to accept the laser vapor one. And I don't know if the other ones have been accepted anywhere yet. You have to inspect your overfilled prevention devices. You have to inspect release section, conduct walkthrough, and have trained operators. So an operator, they have to make sure there are no overfills using proper procedures. What we ask our operators to do is we keep our fill pipes locked. The operator is the only one that keeps that locked. Whenever a delivery driver comes, the operator goes out, they check the spill buckets, make sure there's nothing in them. They unlock the point. They explain to the delivery driver which one's which, so they don't drop fuel in the wrong one. They go back in. When the delivery driver's done, they come back out, they lock the fill point, they make sure the delivery driver left a dry spill bucket and that everything worked right. Um, we have to monitor cathodic protection systems. We don't have any cathodic protection systems on our sites. Um, there's some guidance to monitoring cathodic protection systems. It depends if you have an impress current or a um, rectifier. So you have to know what kind of cathodic protection you have. And those are getting fewer and far between, thank goodness. You also have to conduct release detection on your tanks of piping. You have to document these monthly, make sure your uh, leak detectors are tested annually and all of your documentation is in your books. Robert, if I could just come in with a question, if that's okay. That's okay. Harry Kemp, thank you, Harry, would like to know what do class A, B, and C operators do? I will explain that further in the presentation. Thank you. You're welcome. This is me, my last job. I got to fill them up once. I don't know why they wouldn't let me go back, but your UST system has to be equipped with spill and overflow prevention. So you used to be able to use ball flip valves. Basically, you can't use that anymore. Our sites have flapper valves, which is what these on the top left are. And then we also have overfill arms. And when the delivery driver hooks up to the spill bucket, you want to make sure they're hooked up correctly. This is what a typical tank sump looks like. And these have to be tested by someone. And we usually recommend getting a technician to do it because we don't want our associates climbing in and out of these. They could be considered confined space depending on where you're at. Um, and technicians usually know what they can and can't get wet in there and what, how to dispose of the water properly. So you do your walkthrough inspections. You have to do a walkthrough inspection every 30 days. They're no longer called monthly, they're 30 days. The EPA found people were doing them monthly by coming out on February 28th and do it, and then coming back out on March 1st and do it, and calling that the monthly for February and February monthly for March. So they made it every 30 days now, so you have to make sure you document it every 30 days. And then annually, you have to do a walkthrough inspection. Uh, the AB operator can do some of that walkthrough inspection, but we usually ask um, them to get a contractor to do it because there's a lot of things that are involved with these inspections that take more experience. Uh, operator training has to designate who your ABC operator, trained operators are. They have to do the record keeping and they have to keep their certification on, online as long as they're there. Retraining is required for any operator that their facility is determined to be out of compliance. And that changes by states and I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit too. Uh, they have to respond to suspected releases and actual releases and when you're Checking some of the things, there are some creepy crawlies in there. We had one of our sites in Okinawa that had what's a, a called a habu, which is a very poisonous snake in the nozzle. And one of our store associates just walked out there with a clothes hanger and pulled it out. I thought it was crazy because that thing looked scary. I'm scared of snakes anyway. But, so be careful when you're putting your head in these dispensers or when you're putting your hands in these stumps. There are things out there that will get you. Scorpions, spiders, snakes, other things. Uh, your annual release detection testing, ensure the release detection equipment is operating properly. So you have to get your, if you're using an ATG, it has to be tested. Your sumps sensors have to be tested. Any of the equipment that you're using to do release detection has to be tested. You have to keep these records for three years. Every three years, you have to ensure the spill buckets don't 
allow releases to the environment. And so you can do that visually. You're supposed to check them visually every month. And then you're supposed to take, test them hydrostatically every three years to make sure they don't allow liquid to get in the environment. You can get double wall spill buckets. And then you can put a sensor between those double wall spill buckets. Personally, I like putting a spill bucket in there that you can remove the inside part of the spill bucket to replace it. It's not really double wall, it's more a contained spill bucket like these there in the picture. Because if you use a double wall spill bucket, the sensor in there has to be tested every year. And some of those sensors are not easy to get to. So they have to pull the sensor out, test it, then put it back in. Whereas you could just test it once every three years by putting water in it and it's passed for three years. But it's up to you guys, it's up to the people that build the site, what they use. You have to complete the installation of USC systems and keep these records for three years. Sump, containment sump, also the same thing. You can put a double wall containment sump in, have it monitored, the interstitial area monitored, um, or you can have them tested once every three years if you're using it for interstitial monitoring. And that's basically it. Then you have to have your triannual overfill testing. This has been one that we found has a lot of problems. I'll talk about that in a little bit, but overfill prevention equipment, it's been interesting. You have to keep those records for three years too. So when doing walkthrough inspections, you can use your own checklists in some states. Some states have come out with their checklists and then some just say use PEIRP 900. We combine PEIRP 500 and 900. PEIRP 500 is you inspect dispensers, PEIRP 900 is you check the whole system basically. And we took out any sections that didn't apply like cathodic protection or monitoring wells. And then we just built our own. By doing that, we didn't have to follow them verbatim. Because if you go to use just PEIRP 900, some states will say that you have to use every piece of that. So you have to do daily inspections. You have to do all the things that are in PIRP 900. And we just thought by modeling ours and making our own, we could sidestep that. Here's our system checklist. You guys are welcome to use it, copy it, modify it, use it for your locations. Uh, here's what you need to do daily. Here's what you need to do monthly, annually, and triannually. And we do have some things included on there that aren't EPA, like fuel dispenser calibrations. Uh, those are not required by EPA. Those are required by weights and measures. We don't have to comply with weights and measures, but we wanna make sure we're giving our customers the proper amount of fuel and we're not just giving away fuel too. And so we do that on our own. And we also um, have our filters changed at those times so that our fuel quality is good when it comes out. And here's just a recap of all the things that are walkthrough inspection recap. If you don't have any, you can use, well, that link won't take you anywhere because it goes to our internal server. So sorry about that. Um, look for water in the tanks. One of the things that we see a lot right now is a lot of false alarms for water. A lot of the, the probes are getting gunked up out there. So when they get gunked up, they stick and it looks like you had water in your tank, but you don't. So make sure your site has a tank stick with the proper fuel paste on it which would be like ethanol fuel paste or diesel fuel paste or um, whatever fuel you're, you're holding in those tanks. So some of the regulation impacts. So starting October 13th, you had to test. So basically one, one you're not gonna have a lot of impact. It should, you should have been doing that anyway. You wanna make sure your systems work right. Newly installed emergency generators, it depends uh, if these, you know, it's gonna add a little bit to the operating costs and installation costs. And then for the, the fuel compatibility, you're not really gonna see any effect from those rules unless you start selling those higher blend fuels, the E10, E15s or E85s or B25s. Secondary containment, interstitial monitoring, it's gonna add a little bit to the cost of instruction, construction of your facilities. And then it's gonna add a little bit to getting those things tested over time. Same with your, your under dispenser containment, your line leak detectors. Um, most sites already had line leak detectors. Most of our sites did. So it's not gonna add a lot to us, but having those tested is gonna be an added expense. Most states required you to test them annually anyway, but now you have to, you, don't have, you can't get away with it. And the new UST regulations, 
A, B, and C, UST operators. There's minimal effect to that. Most of the states required that already. Um, sumps and spill buckets have to be liquid type. That's where we see, that's gonna be one of the biggest things that's gonna cost a lot of sites. A lot of these sumps and spill buckets haven't ever been tested. So California estimated when they came out with this that about 50% of sites failed these tests. We're seeing about the same thing at some of our sites. Whenever they go out and add water, they're just, they're draining right to the environment. So this may be an area that is plan ahead for, plan for this expense if you're not doing it already because the, your site's probably gonna fail a lot of these. And then when you go to replace them, try to replace them with something that can be retrofitted easily. Um, there are spill buckets out there that you can just replace the spill bucket without breaking concrete. Because the big cost right now is breaking concrete. When you have to go out there and tear up all the concrete, tear the spill bucket out, put new concrete in, maybe even tear up some, pull up some of the backfill if it's contaminated, it gets pretty expensive. Um, if you have to upgrade your double wall piping, um, that could, kind of be, could be ex expensive. Keeping your test inspection records for three years, you should have been keeping records already. Um, when it says must respond to all sump alarms, you need to document that you responded to those two. No, you can't just respond and say you did it. You need to make sure that that's written down somewhere. Another thing that is not on this list that I probably should talk about a little bit more is your overfill prevention devices. Those are also an area that you have to test those. And because of all the corrosivity of the new fuels, a lot of those are welded in place. And I've seen some of those get mangled to the extent that they can't be taken out of the ground. And so you had, to, the sites had to break concrete, go down, dig to them, remove the whole sum, remove everything to get that fill pipe back out of the ground and then replace it. So that could be another area that's kind of expensive. So final thoughts, I may be running a little late, but I'm, I'm jamming here. One of the things you want to know is where you can get free operator trainings. There's a lot of states that you can get free operator trainings. If you don't do free, they can run from about $150 apiece to up to, I've seen $350 for each operator training. So you want to try and find a way to get those at the least expensive way you can. Uh, operator training, these states, the last time I checked was 2016. So some of these states may have changed. So you need to do your own homework. I've provided links way down in this presentation for what the, um, what they allow you to do for operator training. Uh, reciprocity is what you're looking for. Just do a search on their regulations for operator training for reciprocity. Um, they can range in costs and some of them require an exam. You have to take the ICC test to be an operator. Uh, class C operators usually run around $15. They can get a little bit more expensive but they can be free because AB can provide those class, uh, those operator trainings. And these are some training providers that I'm aware of here. Um, make sure you know all your dates. If your UST system was installed prior to April, 2016, you may still be falling under the 88 UST regulations. So you can use old methods of release detection. You can use your ATG. You can use uh, statistical inventory reconciliation. You can use CSLD. You can use 0.2 gallon per hour test. You can use some of the other methods that are out there, you can still have a ball float valve, but you have to get them tested every year and they're probably gonna be at, removed eventually. You won't have to test your STP sumps or your UDC sumps if you're not using them for interstitial monitoring, but you still have to test your spill buckets, your ATG, your line leak detectors, your overfill devices, those still you have to, but be careful. When I say you don't have to test all your sumps, the EPA came out the letter to New Jersey. Even if you have single wall piping going into a sump, which is what interstitial monitoring is, you still have to test the sumps. Um, the only thing I can say is I've never met an inspector that was wrong. So I would not necessarily agree with what they put out, but they have put out guidance that particularly in New Jersey, if you have a sump, it has to be tested, especially the UDC. Uh, there are states that have more stringent requirements. Uh, this is not a complete list, but California, Rhode Island, Michigan, Connecticut, Nebraska, I know Hawaii is another one that has those. So some of these states have more stringent requirements than what we can 
than what we have to deal with in 40 CFR 280. So if you don't know which one it is, uh, there's a list at the end of this. I tried to capture most of them, but you, you may need to do your own reading in your state's regulations to make sure there's nothing that is more demanding than what the 40 CFR 280 calls for. And I wanted to mention the UST playground. Uh, if you're in Dallas area, which I'm in Dallas, I don't know if I mentioned that, but I'm in the Dallas area. There's a place called Source University in Arlington, Texas. They have erected all of the UST equipment out there for anybody to go look at. You can go in there. They do trainings in there. They do, and I'm not trying to sole source. If there's any other place that does stuff like this, I'm just not aware of it. Um, but it's local for me. It's really cool to go in there. Um, you can go make an appointment with them, call them up and ask them if you can just come look at their stuff. They're more than happy to show you around. And you can see they've got two different kinds of tanks. They don't have a steel tank in there yet. I think they're talking about getting one. They have a, a containment solutions tank and a Xerxes tank in there. Then they have just about every type of piping. They have Incon v and Vita root ATGs in there. They have all the spill buckets and sumps and uh, vent pipes. And so there's lots of different things to look at in there. Give you an idea what these things are instead of just looking at them from above ground. Some of the common violations, and I really thought I had something in there about operator training, but I will talk about that in just a second. Sorry. Um, release detection piping. If you miss your line tests, missing line lead detection functionality tests. If you don't conduct monthly monitoring, you don't keep records, you didn't conduct it. So record keeping is really important. Operator training. If you didn't get all your applicable staff trained, then you will get a violation for that. Walkthrough inspections. It's becoming more common that People don't know they're supposed to be doing walkthrough inspections, but you need to be doing those. And you make sure you're testing your spill buckets. And this is such a preventable thing. Spill buckets is so easy to just keep them clean, make sure there's no water or liquids in them. But even our sites get ridden up for it all the time. And we hammer hammer it. We even ask our sites, they know inspectors coming. They know that the guy's gonna be on site. We tell them, go out and check everything before he gets there. The inspector walks through and there's the spill bucket's full of water. And as the environmental guy for these people, I don't, I do a lot of eye rolling. Um, some things I wanted to touch on, the, these are kind of just insider tips. Fuel grades, a lot of times you'll hear people say they put premium in, they treated their fuel, their car. No, that doesn't work that way. The only time you should put premium in a car is if your manufacturer's manual says to put premium in it. Um, putting premium in a car that takes regular unleaded, doesn't make any difference. Top tier fuels do make a difference. AAA has a study out there saying top tier fuels do clean your engine. So if you can get top tier fuels, uh, Costco sells them. I think there's a list of them. If you Google AAA report on top tier fuels, they will tell you a list of sites that uh, sell top tier fuels. I should have put a link there, but I didn't think of that until the last second. Uh, if you go to a site that has ASTs that sells retail gas, be aware that you may not be getting what you pay for. That's what AST versus UST is indicative of. Fuel expands when it's hot. Fuel in above ground storage tanks stays hot. Fuel in underground storage tanks cools off, usually around 68 degrees. Um, some locales it'll stay in the 80s, especially like Yuma, Arizona or Hawaii or Puerto Rico, places that are, have a really hot climate, the fuel may stay elevated but you got to think outside temperatures are 100 plus so the, uh, one of the things you'll hear is deliveries don't ever fill up when you're the site's getting a delivery um, i wouldn't worry about that there's filters in the dispensers that are supposed to capture all the particulates and water coming from the the tanks um, the one thing i may say if you're getting a delivery in the middle of the day and it's super hot outside you might buy if you don't need gas right then let the temperature cool on the fuel before you actually go do fill up. And if you design a site, that's what this picture on the bottom is supposed to show. The good site designs usually keep people working on the tank system out of traffic flows. So this one is up on the curb, so delivery driver is not in the traffic flow. If you can get the whole tank pit up out of traffic flow, one thing it's water won't drain into the spill buckets or the sumps as easily. Um, it's easier for your associates to get out there and check these areas without being in danger of getting run over. When I worked with the tribes, one of their sites in Muskogee, 
their drive through for the KFC was right there where the tank pit was. So if you tried to go out there anytime between 11 and two, you were going to get run over. It was just, there was no ifs, ands, or buts about it. There's, it's just dangerous. So when you're designing a site, try and think of all the different things. We had a site in Korea that they, they built. The landscapers came in after we built it and planted a tree right over the tank. So we had to explain to them why that was probably a bad idea to plant a tree right over your UST system. And they asked them nicely to remove that. And then some final thoughts. Aging systems, tanks typically have a 30 year warranty. Uh, your piping usually has about a 30 year warranty. That doesn't mean that's the life cycle of that, but if your tank fails before that, remember you've got that warranty to fall back on. So maybe you can actually get that tank repaired or replaced without any funds coming out of your pocket. Life cycle of a tank system, it's one of those things that there's no real good answer to that. Um, it depends. It depends on a lot of things, how the tank was installed, the, the quality of the tank when it was installed, the people that installed it, the location it's at, how it was operated, how well they maintained it. So there's a lot of things. There's no real definitive life cycle to tank systems. Um, people are trying to narrow it down a little bit more, but usually if it hasn't, especially on these new tank systems, if it's a double wall tank system and everything's double walled in there or even triple walled, there are triple walled tanks out there for extremely hazardous materials. Um, if it's never leaked in that interstice, it's probably still good. And there's very little indication that you've got a problem. And knowing when to repair or replace a system, sometimes that's hard to, to tell. And you have to estimate a lot of things. Do you want to just repair this? Is it going to keep giving you problems in the, in the future? Or is it easier just to replace? Some states have regulated this. Um, Hawaii, for instance, says you have to get tanks out by a certain date. California, the single wall tank has to be out by a certain date. Uh, there's another state on the East Coast. They say if this single wall tank meets a certain age, it needs to come out of the ground. So that's being regulated in some states. So be aware these regulations may come into effect if you have single wall tanks. Some new state regulations. Some of them have kept inventory control. I'm not a fan of inventory control. It was supposed to be a temporary measure in 1988. It's basically an accounting of your fuel plus minus, and you're allowed to leak 120 gallons plus 2% or 1% of your fuel. It's not an effective method, but it's still something that some states require. It is a paperwork hassle for our managers. So if you have any input on inventory control at gas stations, please try to get it taken out of the regulations. And the timelines for these states, they can vary. So you need to make sure you keep up to date on when your timelines are, what's being enforced, what's not being enforced. Um, corrosion, the new fuels, you see a lot of corrosion in the tanks. Um, technology, as a Tank Talk Tuesday video they put out, usually with the camera inside tanks, shows you a lot of the corrosive things that are going on inside tanks. There's a, a lot of things, the cracking, splacking, spalding, um, different things that are going on, of course, rust. And then you have all the, the bungs that are rusting and those rust particles are falling down in your fuel and then they get built up in your tanks and they become an issue too. So people are starting to look at fuel cleaning more often or fuel polishing. Um, the new fuels, of course, you know, we had leaded fuels, we had MTBE, we now have ethanol fuels. Um, different additives are being put in and considered to these fuels and these things are causing different issues with the tanks. Make sure your filters are changed, the calibrations are done. And knee shaft testing is often overlooked. It's a air testing that you have to do to make sure your vapor, your vent pipes are capturing vapors in the tanks, not allowing them to escape to the atmosphere. Uh, COVID-19 put a halt on a lot of the inspections that were going on. That ended on August 31st. So the temporary enforcement of the policy is no longer in effect. And so they can come out and look at your sites now let me think about the operator training. Class A, B operators, basically those guys are in charge of everything, paperwork to do with your systems. Make sure your leak detection records are kept. Make sure if you have to keep financial responsibility, they keep those records. They have, um, make sure that any kind of inspections that are being done are being done. They are supposed to be doing walkthrough inspections, supposed to train your class C operators. If you want to send me a message on any you know, LinkedIn or uh, my email address, which I think is at the very first, 
you can send me a message. I can elaborate more on those. Your class C operators are basically your spill response guys. They need to know what to do if there's an emergency, if somebody's on fire out front, where the emergency stop button is. Usually there's one located at your cash registers, how to clean up a spill. Um, I've seen many times, which amazes me, that we have a lot of spills from people that have holes in their gas tanks. And I never knew that was an issue until I started working for the exchange. And about once a month, we get a report, somebody spilled fuel everywhere because they had a hole in their gas tank. And I was out in England and I'm trying to teach some of our associates about gas station stuff out there. And we're looking at the dispensers and a guy's filling up his Jeep on the next dispenser and I hear water running. I look over and it's just running out of his, it's running out as fast as he's putting it in. And we're like, sir, excuse me, you're, you're leaking fuel everywhere. And he goes, yeah, I know. I got to put it in really fast because there's a hole in my pipe. So if I put it in fast, it'll go past that hole. And so when we asked him to stop, he said, no, I got to get gas. So they called the MPs on him and had him dealt with. But it was, it's just amazing the things that are out there. And if you print this off, you'll find out that I put a whole bunch of links and other sites of interest and all sorts of stuff that I didn't think I had time to take care of um, during this presentation. So, holy crud, am I still on? Yes, you're still here, yes. How long was I supposed to go? Because it's like two o'clock. It's three o'clock, so <laughs> it ends, it's supposed to end at three. Um, I'm looking to see if we have any questions I'll or in the chat. Oh. Huh? You're in different times. <laughs> um, our poll, did you want to hear the results of the poll? Yes. Let's hear what people are. Zero percent said, I'm a lust guru. 13% oh, said, I'm not sure what UST stands for. 80% said, I'm pretty familiar with the 40 CFR 280. And 6% said, I deal with UST regulations every day. All right, I got one more video for you guys. This is one of my favorite. Oh, this is my second favorite. So this, when I talk about things that can happen at gas stations, I'm literal, anything can happen at a gas station. And the things that do occur are entirely crazy. This is my favorite video. Our video of the day. Look what happens when an out of control driver crashes into a gas station. This is in West Virginia. It's coming up right here. Store employees say they think the driver fell asleep. He hit the gas pump, which explodes. Look at that. Never even slowed down there. He hits into the convenience store, narrowly misses three people. The whole thing caught on security camera. You see that beam there? That came within inches of basically killing one of the clerks there. Amazingly, though, there's that beam there. You see it's coming so close to that individual. Amazingly, again, so that's one of my favorite videos about gas stations. Um, I want to promote one person that does a lot of videos for USTs and gas station stuff. Uh, if you guys have never heard of Ben Thomas, he has a whole series of tank savvy minutes. Hi, there. this is Ben Thomas with UST Training, and this is a tank savvy minute. Today we're going to learn about underground storage tanks, which ones you have at your site, and what each tank contains. We're standing here. Oh, that caught him in a very at the gas station. You know, notice that there is a nice straight line of lids, ending with the yellow lid here. Yellow means diesel, so we have a diesel underground storage tank here. We walk over to the next one. Red is going to be our super unleaded. Again, we've got a super unleaded underground storage tank here. White is going to be our regular unleaded. So we've got a regular unleaded underground storage tank here. And then finally, the fourth one over is mid-grade, mid-grade underground storage tank. So we now know we have four tanks here, diesel, super, regular, mid-grade. We now know what is at our site. Your job as a good operator is to know exactly what type of fuel and what, how many tanks are at your facility. This is Ben Thomas with UST Training. So I'll take any questions, any, any questions, any, any. Okay. So at this time, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat. I'm not sure. I'm thinking we're having a glitch. We're having an issue at this time. So I'm going to ask if you do have any questions um, 
for Robert that you direct them to his um, to him directly. Um, he is located. Um, his profile is located here on the Pathable site, so you can contact him directly. But unfortunately, the chat has broken down because we have gone a little over our time. I'm sorry. I'm it's wondering. okay. But what I can tell you is before that happened, a lot of people were saying how wonderful the presentation was and they really, really enjoyed it. And they said it was not only enjoyable, but funny as well. Thank you so much. They learned a lot. And so did I. That's just because I'm funny looking and I can't help. <laughs> <sighs> you knew something. Thank you, everyone, for participating. We truly appreciate it. Ha you. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you, Robert. Really great job. See you all later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.